so we're going to we're going to rebuild guide bushings today. I'm going to start with a lot of stuff that may be extremely obvious and maybe even redundant to a lot of people, but I'd really rather you hear it twice and then miss something and say, gee, I wish he'd have mentioned it. Uh, and on that vein, we're going to start right here. Every guide bushing that comes out of Citizen on the guide bushing housing is going to have a laser etched series of numbers, and you're looking at some right now. Uh, these laser numbers, okay, this is the machine type that this guide bushing came out of. These are the numbers we're really going to concern ourselves with. These denote the type of guide bushing, the model number, if you will, of the guide bushing we're concerning ourselves with. In this case, dash one is a revision number. The last number or the serial number of the guide bushing itself, which does not really concern us. The numbers we're going to worry about are the U2150Z. OK, now uh, U2150Z. What kind of guide bushing are we talking about? Well, it's handy because if you look in the maintenance manual, the U2150Z is going to give you ah the assembly order of that guide bushing. So if you've never seen that guide bushing before, OK, there it is. There it's there's the parts layout on it and also. The part numbers now, OK, I think everybody that works for Citizen should in fact already know this. And so if that's the case, why Rich are you mentioning it? Well, we've seen an influx of European market machines and rumor has it even a couple of Asian market machines. If that, if you get one of these, that U2150Z number is going to be different. Now the parts may look the same. The parts breakdown may look the same. They're different. OK, so uh, I assure you, you if you try to use these parts in an Asian market machine or a European market machine, it's not going to work to your benefit. So uh, we actually even had a case where customers sent one in. All the paperwork said yes, U 2150Z. No, it was a European market machine. And in fact, he needed a bearing sleeve. It's a part we do not stock. So. Um, when you get one of these in, pay attention to that number. Um, it can cause you grief if you don't. OK, makes sense. All right. All right, some of the tools that we use. All right, on the left side, you're going to see some of the chemicals that we're using. Uh, the Loctite, I want to point out, is not a permanent Loctite, but this is a thread locker that can be removable. Uh, when we get down to the bearings, you're going to need a grease. This is a grease we carry here. This is primarily the only grease I would ever recommend that you use in these bearings. OK, uh, above that, you're going to see a silicone sealant. Um, it's kind of specialized, although I will tell you it is available on Amazon.com. To the right, you're going to see a couple of the tools. Now, the tools vary according to the guide bushing. Uh, at the top, you're going to see made out of a old sleeve. We've created a tool. At the bottom, you're going to see a base that we've created. This works on a number of different guide bushings. Yes, these are in fact homemade tools. We do not provide these. Um, if you're going to think you're going to get into the business of rebuilding guide bushings, these are tools you're going to have to fabricate on your own. Dimensions, well, I can provide them if you need them, but uh, as I stress, we do not manufacture these tools for people, uh, something you have to come up with on your own. You see a piece of brass there. As you work on these, I put in a representative piece of brass. You're going to need various and sundry sizes of brass, but uh, when you're working with these bearings and some of these steel parts, never steel on steel. Brass is your medium of choice. You're going to see there onto the left here, you're going to see a couple of three millimeter pins. These are dowel pin stock. You're going to have to use these in the fields, or if you're doing this on a one shot basis, you're going to have to secure the base of your guide bushing with these and put these in a vise. I'm going to have a picture of that a little bit later. And we have what we call a variable pin face wrench. 
this is this here is what you're going to use to remove the cap or the bearing nut depending on the configuration. This is something that you'd have to buy for yourself. So what do we have? We have a homemade tool. We have a length of brass you can get anywhere. We have a homemade tool. And really the only thing in this picture that you would actually be able to buy over the counter is this device here and these pins. Um, I do have a source for this, which we can get into later. All right, so now this is just a cross section of a representative guide bushing. Not the one we're actually talking about in particular because you're going to notice this one actually has three bearings in it. Although notice also it does show you the orientation of the bearings, which comes in useful. If, a, if you're looking at a brand new one, these are the tolerances of the, um, the parts if you were to put a dial indicator on them. Now, they're in millimeters, and what comes to point comes to mind here is they're very close tolerances. And if you think about the nature of a guide bushing in general, that really kind of makes sense. I mean, really, it's a spindle. So, of course, your tolerances are going to be close. Now, I, I mentioned here D, radial play. There's really, really no, honestly, there's really no good way to check that. But if you've got new bearings in it and your other numbers are good, uh, you can make a pre pretty reasonable assumption that your radio play is going to be good too. Um, use bearings, that's not a given for sure. I do mention here that, um, and by the way, run out of taper, 0 0.003, that's roughly, that's just, uh, that's a hair over uh, one ten thousandth of an inch. Run out of the ID is uh, in the same ballpark, okay? Uh, thrust, which is also known as end play, is noticed is less than that. That's like uh, eight microns, if you will. So, so we're not fooling around there. Um, I say spec A, run out of the taper. This is the taper here. If you're checking a used guide bushing, you can always pretty much expect that that taper is going to be less than the run out of the internal bore. Now, why do I say that? Well, we're talking about a used guide bushing. Why? It came in for rebuild, so somebody used it and they didn't send it in for no reason. Well, the clamping of the guide bushing collet on that taper um, creates wear. So don't be surprised if you run this and you see a little bit more wear on A than you do when checking B. It's not, not at all out of the ordinary, um, but it can be a critical number. This makes sense. Like I said, these numbers are what you would expect with a new one. And there's no reason, by the way, if you rebuild one, that you can't get close to these numbers or at these numbers when you're done. All right, all right. Now, I'm gonna do some indicator readings on this. And you're gonna say, well, wait a minute, Rich, we didn't do any rebuilding yet. So what the heck are you doing indicating a used guide bushing? Well, here's the deal. Number one, you're going to be taking parts out. You're going to be cleaning parts. You're going to be spending a lot of time and effort on parts. Well, if I've got bad parts, why would I waste my time? Number one. Number two, I like to get a baseline because if I run this guide bushing and I make checks on this, and let's say just for the sake of argument, I run a run out check on the inner bore of this guide bushing and I get say, two ten thousandths of an inch. OK, I put this sleeve in, I do my rebuild and I run the same check afterwards and I get three ten thousandths of an inch. I did something wrong. OK, so uh, I like to do this as a baseline. Um, the other thing that I like to check is, as we just talked about previously, all right, I'm going to run concentricity. I want concentricity to be a tenth. I'm also going to check the taper run out or the yeah, concentricity of the taper, if you will. Well, if I've got real good concentricity on my inner bore, 
and my taper is way out to launch, that sleeve is no good. So why would I spend a lot of time cleaning it and trying to clean it up and checking it for bearing run out, et cetera, if I'm gonna scrap the part anyways? So uh, as a general course of action, I like to do the indicator readings before I break the unit down. Um, so that's why we're gonna run through indicator readings now, because even though we're gonna do them when we're done rebuilding it, we're gonna actually do them more than once. You will notice, by the way, a couple of things. There is no cap on this. I've taken the cap off, okay? Because I do not, the cap can cause me trouble. I don't want the cap to influence. I'm more interested in the sleeve. I'm more interested in the raw readings. The thing that's extremely important, and I really want you to take a note of here, notice where I mounted the magnetic base. The magnetic base is mounted directly to the body of my guide bushing, okay? So effectively, this is a monolithic unit. That's important. If you don't do this, it's gonna affect your readings. And believe me, you're not gonna like them, okay? So always do this. Magnetic base is mounted to the housing. The indicator is running in, inside here. I've got a couple of pictures of this. All right, now this is kind of hard to see, but I'm in here, I'm inside the bore. This, this bore area is machined. There is an area that isn't, so make sure you're on the machined area, okay? So I'm running, I'm checking run out of my sleeve one ten thousandths of an inch or better. It's important. Now, I may not get that, okay? Because keep in mind, I haven't rebuilt the darn thing yet, but I want to know what I get to start, okay? Here's just another view. This is cruder, and excuse the messy workbench. I didn't do it. Um, what we're showing you here is just in general, now in this case, he's checking the taper. You're rotating it on the, on the, um, well, it's not really a gear, it's the belt drive pulley. Um, do this smoothly, not quickly, smoothly, slowly. You're, you wanna see a smooth rotation and you wanna see if it's, not only do you get a good reading, but you get a repeatable reading. OK, I, I think this is straightforward. I think everybody knows how to do this. But as I said, I would rather you see it something, you know, than uh, something you gee, I wish he had told me. OK, now we're also going to check end play. Now I've, I've included two shots here. Um, it's more important. I want, to, want you to see where the stylus is actually located because we're going to go into the face of the guide bushing. Um, in this case, it's it's clear clear to see where I'm mounting the stylus. Although I have to tell you honestly, that's a very very. That's, I'm not really honestly happy with that angle. I would like I would like a lot less angle just because it's easier on the indicator itself. But it does get the point across. What I'm doing is is I'm I'm measuring the face of the guide bushing. And by the way, these are different. Notice in this case, by the way, that the cap is still on. Uh, that can affect your reading, so I would be happier if it wasn't. This is actually a much better setup here than this. But you do get the idea. I mean, it does actually cl more clearly show what we're trying to achieve. So I'm on the face of my guide bushing sleeve, and now I push. We're not trying to deliver a baby here, but we are still going to put, we're going to allow a healthy push motion. Okay. Less than a tenth. Less than a tenth. Okay. You may actually see a little bit of spring on your indicator. That's okay. But I want to see less than a tenth of motion. Okay. And once again, now these numbers are on our unit we have yet to take apart. So, Excuse me a minute there. So if you don't get that, well, you might you very well might have bad bearings, and it's it's not beyond the pale. As a matter of fact, that you do. But 
keep in mind what these readings are before the rebuild because we're going to revisit them and these tolerances are going to come back then and then then we have no forgiveness. OK, are we are we clear so far? Make sense? Okay. So far, so good. OK, all right, so now we've done that. Now I said do those with the cap removed. All right, well, OK, if you hadn't done it, you should have done it beforehand. But in any case, at this point, if you haven't done it already, I want you to take the, the cap off. Now the cap is usually only held on with a couple of screws. Usually sometimes two on one side and a couple on the other. Usually there's a block that mounts around this and uh, that comes off. In this case, you can see one, two, three screws there. Usually there's one here. They're usually M3 screws. Take that cap off. OK, now you got the cap off. Well, before we go much farther, let's take a real good look. Obviously, it's a used guide bushing. That cap's going to show that it's been through the wars. You're going to see some dents in it. You're going to see some scratches in it. You're just going to see some things that show, hey, it's been used. All right, how bad are those dents? Do the dents come through? Well, there is an area here of free area where you can take a dent that might actually dent into the inside area of that cap that doesn't hurt anything. But there's also areas where that dent is significant because this is, of course, is a rotating surface. This is all stationary. So if you see a dent, pay very careful attention. Is there also a wear mark on that dent? Does it go through? This area here is a very precision ground or machined area. Look that area very carefully. Obviously, it has to be round. Check that area very carefully for heat damage because if it's been hitting, if it's been rubbing across this sky bushing sleeve, you're going to see heat. Heat's very bad, very, very bad. So look for heat discoloration, look for rub marks, look for any signs of wear, especially you'll see it on the inside. Sometimes you'll see a lot of dirt and crap in here and uh, that'll, that'll be misleading. So you look at it before you've cleaned it, and you especially want to look that area, especially around this bore, very, very carefully after you've cleaned it. OK. Makes sense. All right, so now now I flip this thing over. Now you remember in one of my first pictures when I showed you tools, I showed you two dowel pin rings that were three millimeters by roughly three inches long. What I've done here is and and this is May, you may want to magnify the picture. I think uh, control and with your scroll wheel, you can see it here. This is those pins are mounted in the, the pin holes um, that hold, in this case, the cap on. And I've mounted those dowel pins here and I've secured them in the vise. That's what's holding this up. This is actually elevated, which you would not do. This was just done so that you can see how I've done that. And and I'll be the first to tell you it's it's a crude way of doing it, but it's pretty much in the field. The only way you have to do it. You saw we have a plate with four dowel pins sticking out of it for various size guide bushings. Um, if you're going to do this on a regular basis, I would recommend you make something up. I, I freely admit this is a very crude way to do that, to hold this. Um, but without a fixture or a specialized tool, it's the only game in town. So now what you are going to do, as I said, in this case, this, this sky bushing has been flipped upside down. Uh, you have a nut. This has to be removed. This is where this variable face wrench comes into play. Now, this darn well better have been secured with a little bit of liquid wrench thread locker. Now, you can try right off the bat to see if that's going to come off. The answer better be no, OK? Because especially if your indicator checks look, look like they're anywhere in decent shape, that thing is not going to be loose. So what do you do? Well, I put I recommend right around this area here. Oops, I'm sorry about that. 
Let's see if I can get that back. Right around in this thread area, I put a little bit of liquid wrench. I put that soak in, not a lot, don't, don't need a lot. And I recommend heating it up with a torch. You can use a hot air gun. Hot air gun is a really good idea or a propane torch. And I heat up those threads. Now, when I say heat them up, look, you're not trying to discolor the metal. You're not trying to do any impromptu soldering or brazing or anything else like that. You just want to get it hot, hotter than warm, not so hot that you're discoloring the metal. And I stress that. Uh, and in some cases there's bearings, not in this case particular, but in some cases there's bearings fairly close underneath that. So you don't want to go crazy with it, but get it nice and hot, hot, hot. Shall we say 300 degrees? Okay. And let it sit maybe a minute. Okay. Now, if this was me in this particular case, I would also have somebody holding a block maybe just a block of hardwood over the top of this pressing down and then I would have somebody here maybe just tapping on the end of it with a hammer and usually one good shock and you'll be able to break that loose and now of course it's just a normal thread it's not reverse thread and then you just unthread this okay it's a technique it takes a little bit get used to but it's it's not bad uh, I will say that uh, we do it on a regular basis and we have pretty good luck with it. Um, as I said, it's a te technique thing. Now you've taken that off. These were those threads that that thing unscrewed for. And by the way, there will be a little bit of residue left over there. And now you have the ability to take this drive off, this drive pulley off. And the drive pulley is not threaded. It just slides right off. Now you can barely see it here. There are two keyways, one there and one there. Okay, so now you're going to pry it off. Um, sometimes it's going to fight you a little bit. It's it's a close fit, so I do, don't expect it to fall off because it's not going to fall off, and the keys also hold you. Um, little gentle persuasion with a pair of screwdrivers is okay. Um, brass is better. What you do not want to do under any circumstances is you do not want to mar this surface. It's steel, but doesn't mean you can't mar, mar it with a screwdriver or something like that. And this surface mates up with this surface here. Under no circumstances do you want to gall this surface, okay? Because it's important, especially this surface as we're going to see later. Now in this picture, there. There are two keys. As I said, keyways are here, and these are the keys. Now, in this case, he's just take, using a knife to just get under the end. You can, uh, you can do that. You can also, with a brass punch or brass that's actually made into like a chisel type effect, you can actually just drive these out, tapping gently. At no point, by the way, on these do you ever need a really big hammer. OK, if you're going for the big hammer, you're doing something wrong. So stop, set back, think about what you're doing. If you need a big hammer, there's a problem. OK, now one other thing here. Um, inside this, this is the back side of the guide bushing sleeve. Inside this sleeve, there's a pin. Now that pin lines up with the guide bushing collet. Usually there's a, once again, there's like a keyway of, of, of sorts on the guide bushing collet, and that pin helps to orient the collet. Which is, by the way, when we talk about that collet, that collet's what creates the wear on the taper, which is why you're going to have better run out on the inside bore and worse run out on the taper. It's that collet. Collet always goes in the same way because of the pin you're going to find when you look down in here, okay? Now, the pin, these keys that you take out, one of them is going to be directly oriented over top of that internal pin. As such, it's gonna have a mark on it. That mark right there. Only one of them is gonna have that mark. And what I'm talking about is that little chisel mark there. 
it's been highlighted here in color. Yours isn't going to be that way. This is just to show you what the mark looks like. OK. Now. The this one in particular is a larger version and you notice it's got a screw hole in it. The screw hole is allow you put a, a tiny screw in there and actually drive this out of the body of the guide bushing sleeve that it was was holding it. Smaller ones don't have that screw hole. Uh, I will mention in passing, this one's pretty well dogged up. This one would never be reinstalled. It's not in good condition. Uh, treat these nicely. This one is unfit for future service, but it does make a good photography model. So far, so good. So far, OK. So far, you're good. OK, now the drive gear or drive pulley it's not technically a gear. You all know that because it's driven by a belt. Also may or may not also have an alignment mark too. There it is in this case. OK, be aware of it. Now, the problem here is. They don't always have one. <laughs> so you can, yeah, as you see, by the way, number one, it's not very big. Number two, it's not always a line. Sometimes it's just a dot. Number three, sometimes there isn't one. <laughs> so um, you can drive yourself crazy. Look for it. Be aware it's there. If it's there, it lines up with that internal pin. If you don't have one, oh well, you don't have one. Um, I have to say, lately I see more that do not have the mark than do. So don't be surprised if you don't see it. Uh, it doesn't stop me for looking for one anyways, so you know, be aware of it. Um, it always makes me happier to see one because you know it's there. Why do they put these marks there? It's for reasons of balancing because keep in mind, of course, that these things can run 6000 RPM easy. And uh, so if they put one there, they put one there for a reason. So please pay attention and put it back the way it came out. And that's pretty much all I'm going to say about that. OK, so you've taken all the back, backside stuff out and that that all all of that equipment came out here. All of that came out here, so now you can drive that out. You can you notice it's sitting on a block of wood here. You can start by just banging the housing down and this will start to drive out. It's it's a press fit. It's it it's tight. It's tight. OK. Um, so it's going to take some banging when I said you don't need a hammer. Well, you don't, but you're going to need a little bit of force here. OK, don't be surprised. OK, um, what you're doing is is you're driving this guide pushing sleeve out of the bearings. And by the way, you can actually even see some bearing wear right here. Now, OK, so you've driven it down here. It's now flush, but obviously this thing isn't still not ready to come out. What what you can do and what I like to do is, is I will flip this over at this point when it's gone this far. I hold it in a vise. Resting here and here. I still use soft jaws because I, you know, just just hold it gently. And then now that it's upside down, I Press on this surface here and this surface here with a brass brass rod and, a, and tap it with a hammer. And uh, I drive it the rest of the way out. Now on the bottom of the vise, I like to put either a piece of wood, some cloth, something like that. I don't want to drop this thing. I don't want it to just fall and land on the floor. It's good hard, hard quality steel, but I, I don't want to mistreat it. Make sense? Clear? Any questions so far? So far, so good, Rich. OK, all right. Either uh, either we're doing a good job or everybody decided they don't want to do it at all. I don't know which. OK, so now we've got the sleeve out now and this is pretty much self explanatory. We're we're going to get into the bearings themselves. OK, uh, this is not really these these screws are tight. Very tight, but uh, they're not torqued to any specific tolerance. Um, 
an Allen wrench will take them out. You may have to use a little force. You may have to put a brag on the end of it to protect your hand, but you know, they're going to come out. Um, what you notice is when you take them out is the bearings sit up slightly. They sit proud of this housing. Okay, no big deal there. Okay, now I've got that out. Now the whole thing can come apart. These should tap out. In this case, on this particular one that we're, we're using as an example, there's only two bearings. There's others that have three. There's others that have four. There's there are multiple configurations on these. Um, this is the configuration we use just just for this. So I have a bearing. This looks like bearings. They're not bearings. That's a bearing spacer. And what you have here is an inner bearing spacer and another bearing. So bearing spacers to bearing. OK, and the housing. Now here's another view of this. And what's important here is is on these spacers notice there's a hole notice there's a hole okay it's for lubrication purposes or air purposes actually um in this case on this particular model it's centered so we don't really have to worry about that but that's not always the case not necessarily the case so on some models be very careful when you're reassembling that that doesn't necessarily have to be lined up hole to hole, but it does have to be lined up spatially within the housing if they're if it's not centered. On the spacer, so it's just something to be aware of. Oh, excuse me about that. OK, now cleaning bearings. Now let me start by saying first and foremost. Some guide bushings use sealed bearings. If you've got sealed bearings, you're a happy person because none of this applies. Excuse me, just one second. If you have seal bearings, you take them out, you give them a bit of a wipe, a minor wipe down, and you install them and you go off to the races. Most most units don't. Now, having said that, there are occasions where you can replace these non sealed bearings with possibly as an option. You can get sealed bearings and in this day where a lot of a lot, maybe most units are using a high pressure coolant system. Um, that may be desirable. Uh, sealed bearings are more expensive and these bearings are not cheap to begin with, so. Uh, it might be something you might want to consider. You might want to talk to the parts department and you might want to say, hey, if you know the applications that this particular machine is using and they're using a lot of high pressure coolant, they're aimed right at the guide bushing and uh, maybe you took it apart and you found coolant on the inside of the bearings that you took out. You may want to ask the parts department, are sealed bearings available? You'll pay more for them, but possibly it's an option uh taking the reverse standpoint if the guide bushing came with sealed bearings i absolutely do not recommend replacing sealed bearings with open bearings if it was designed with sealed bearings it was for a reason so um it does not pay to go cheaper um i think in the long run it, it's it's a bad idea if they were sealed to begin with uh the designers knew what they were doing and stick with them. But on the other hand, um, if you can get them and you're willing to pay the extra cost and you think it's worth it, it it's an idea. Anyways, back to these bearings. Unfortunately, we don't have sealed bearings. We have regular bearings. Now, when you take them out of the package, you're going to notice that they're not squeaky clean, shall we say. Um, so wipe them down. They have Usually it's almost like a waxy preservative on them. And we're going to get rid of that because that that does not suit our purposes. OK, now uh, when I showed you at the first couple of pages, I showed you some of the tools we were using. What I should have mentioned was is the backdrop for those tools is a lint free cloth. And in this case, yeah, you see here you see a white cloth and you also see a blue cloth. They're both the same thing. 
They're called white balls. W Y P A L. They're a Kimberly Clark product and they're a lint free cloth. They're not the only lint free cloths that are out there. They're the ones we happen to use. We've had good results with them. You do not want to put lint in the bearings. And you do at this point from here on in, you want to keep these things clean. OK, so we're going to wipe or just going to give them a cursory wipe. We want to get the obvious residue off the outside of these bearings and we're going to clean them. We're going to start by soaking them. Hey, Rich, uh, we have a question here. Sure, go ahead. OK, uh, are the bearings easy to come out or do you need a special torque wrench to remove and put them back in? Uh, no, 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 the bearings, the bearings might take a little bit of a tap, a little bit of a tap, but a light tap. Uh, sometimes you can just literally push them out with your thumb. Um, but no, no, they're they're not a rigid press fit. Um, I, I would say it's a very loose press fit. So no, no, you can you you can almost use the backside of a hammer or or uh, a brass rod. A brass rod without the use of a hammer will usually just drive them right out. I would add that it's a citizen perfect fit. <laughs> <laughs> I, I couldn't have put it better. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. No, it it, it is. It is. Um, it, it, it's not. It's it's more than a slip fit. But um, but yeah, you like I said, you really don't. You you definitely do not need a hammer. Let's put it that way. Make sense. Thank you very much. OK, all right. So now I've, I've wiped the obvious residue off and now I'm going to place these bearings in a bath of clean denatured alcohol. Now you notice I said here 10 minutes, no longer. And boy, do I mean it, OK? I use denatured alcohol. That's what we recommend. Denatured alcohol or wood alcohol, if you will, is really only 10% methanol. The nice thing about this is, is it dries without a residue. Now, when, why do I say 10 minutes? OK, um, it's still an alcohol product. OK, now these bearings typically have a phenolic cage. OK, the cage is what holds the ball bearings in place. And typically it's made out of a phenolic resin. If you leave this in denatured alcohol for much more than 10 minutes, you run the risk of making that phenolic cage brittle. And by the way, that's a denatured alcohol with a 10% methanol in it. OK, that's that's just the way it comes. You can buy it, by the way, at Home Depot. Um, you can imagine if you use a stronger alcohol. And that's a 10 minutes. Uh, a stronger alcohol will make that phenolic cage even more brittle. And that's a very, very bad thing. Come on, because these bearings can turn up to, well, what? 10,000 RPM? You really don't want to do that, OK? So yeah, we want to soak them. We want to get any shipping residue, any, you know, I won't say they weren't greased from the factory they were, but they weren't greased the way we need them. You want that out. So yeah, you need an alcohol solution to break that up and get it out, but you don't want to sit in there too long because any anything you put in there is aggressive to this bearing cage. So I say 10 minutes, I mean it. Don't, don't mess around with it. Um, I will say honestly, since I've been there and I've been doing this and we pay attention to this, we do not have a problem. We don't get them back with bad bearings. I will say I have seen bearings, not done by us, but I have seen bearings that have come back with fractured cages. And, and one of the things we in the shop that do this question is, is like, well, how long were they soaked for? So. We do know, we can say, my, myself and my associates that do this, you do it for 10 minutes, you're religious about it, you take them out, you're not going to hurt the cage. So I stress this and I, yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm on my high horse about it. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Because these are not cheap bearings and you really don't want to hurt them. Okay. Like I said, I'm stressing it. Yes, I am. Okay. All right, so we've done this, and you can even rinse them around and wash Rich, them around. We got a question here. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, how can I know when a machine needs a, re a bearing replacement? Okay. Well, and typically, by the way, when you rebuild these, uh, the bearings are 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 what go. 
And how, how do you know you need it? Well, you're typically going to see it in machine finish, OK? Um, you're going to see chattering. You're not going to get the, you, you might see it in overall loss of tolerance on the part, OK? Because keep in mind, the guide bushing is pretty much the last thing that, you know, your, your stock sees. Um, so you might see it in loss of tolerance. You know, you, you're starting to see that, uh, well, you're at the larger end of your tolerance. Um, you'll, you will very, very often, you will see it in the quality of the finish of the part. Um, that's been pretty much, pretty much what we see when we get these back as, as the complaint. Now, I, I would open this up to the floor. Um, there are people that have had much more machining experience than I have that may have some other things. But but those are the two most typical complaints with when we get a guide bushing back. I think it's all of the above, and then also heat. You can tell if if you know everything's running hot, or some people don't run tight tolerance. They don't see the finish, but they can say, "Holy cow, this thing's hot." <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, that's an that's an excellent point. Yes, yes, and and literally sometimes you can actually even see it on the uh, guide bushing sleeve itself too. Um, but yeah, th th those those are the most obvious clues. Thank you. OK. All right, so now we, we've soaked them. We, we soaked them for 10 minutes. Um, you know, if you get a phone call, you go, unfortunately, you got to drop that phone. You got to get them out 10 minutes. I mean it. Um, now you take them out and you let them dry. Now we say air dry. You can't go wrong with air drying, OK? But if you insist you're on a time schedule and you got to get going all right you want to put an air gun to them <laughs> okay go ahead put an air gun to them but not full pressure not full pressure please and hold that bearing in such a way that the ball bearings themselves aren't spinning and the inner race isn't spare isn't spinning yeah and you can then pss, yeah, pss, yeah you can blow them dry you can you can do that you can but but exercise exercise care now at this point though that now that you've done this with alcohol and they're dry don't let them spin okay because you've got virgin metal against virgin metal you can score the surface of either the ball bearing or the races very very easily so you know don't spin them don't spin them at all uh if you're putting them down if you if you're not handling them if you're gonna for whatever reason, you're going to leave them unattended. Put them down on a clean cloth. Cover them with a clean cloth because because at this point they're very very susceptible to damage. Uh, best thing to do is, is if if you've done that is that at this point put them directly into a, a bath of light spindle oil. We use uh, Velocite three. It's a very light spindle oil. Okay. Now you can leave them in the spindle oil. I you can leave them in there for however long you need, it really doesn't matter because the oil isn't going to hurt them. The oil is not corrosive. The oil doesn't hurt the bearing cages and uh, you can leave them in there till you're ready. Uh, I think that makes sense, right? We okay with that? We clear? It's an, it's an yep. important step, so I, I just want to make sure that we understand that. All right, so there they are. Now these these are happy bearings have come out of the spindle oil. The same thing when they come out, though, you want to leave them on a lint-free cloth. Uh, we show here in the lower picture we we use we use a syringe to inject the the grease into the ball bearings. We like to get it right to the right to the source of the ball itself. Um, you can also apply it with with a, a stick or a, a fine stick. I don't want I don't want you breaking off any wood though or anything else like that. So I don't want to say a toothpick because that's asking for trouble. Um, if you can get a little syringe, that's that's mo that's recommended. Now we are applying grease because we took everything out and now this is that same grease I showed you in one of the first slides and one of the tools. You I do believe you can even get it through Amazon, but we carry it. It's the only grease I recommend. And um, how much grease? Now, this is also, I'm going to expound on this. Uh, I learned this. This is one of the very, very first lessons I learned. And uh, it's, it's a good one, folks. It's a good one. How much grease? 
a match head's worth to each individual ball bearing. OK, a match head's worth. Each ball bearing, no more. Now you'd think. As I did, I have to tell you, I thought that too. Well, if a match head worth is good, more is better, right? No, absolutely wrong. A match head is worth on each ball bearing and you're done. Why is not, why is more not better? Okay, well, there's, there's two reasons really. Well, if you imagine a big pot of oatmeal and you're stirring it with a ladle, okay? Well, it's really hard to stir that oatmeal with a ladle, you know? It's really hard to do that. Well, if you put a lot of grease in here and you're turning it at 10,000 RPM, that's your ladle and that's your pot of oatmeal. That extra grease just acts as drag. It doesn't help you at that point. It's excess. It's not doing lubrication. It's just excess drag. It doesn't help. It doesn't help. Number one. Number two, that excess grease it's not against the ball bearing. It's not against an inner race. It's just in there. It's just a thermal blanket, folks. It just holds in heat, so it doesn't do you any good. So more is not better. I know the temptation is out. Pack that grease in there, baby. More is better. It's not. It's just it's not, folks. It really isn't. So you really, really need to understand that mindset. And, and I got to tell you, I had a really good teacher that showed me that, and I think of him every single time I put this grease in there. But it's true. It's true. Believe me, it's true. So match head worth of grease, each individual ball bearing, and that's what you see in the top screen. Now, in this case, this guy's not using, this guy's using what looks like a tie wrap for Pete's sake. Now, tie wrap's not a bad idea. Match head's worth on each individual ball. Okay, you've done that. Gently rotate the inner race so you're spreading that around a little bit. And you're calling it good. That's all there is to it. Now when you put it back down, lint free cloth, cover it up because now you've got grease. Grease will attract dirt, so please keep it covered. OK, making sense? Yep, Any we have questions a question on here? that? Uh, we have a question. How easy is it to remove the dry belt and does the machine have a screw tensioner and does the same belt drive to the spindle to the spindle? Well, that kind of depends on the machines. Um, well, yes, yes, it's how I'll tell you what to take it out. You really usually you do not have to, in fact, untension. The belt, OK? Usually, usually there are four screws that hold the guide bushing in place. All right. And there's also there are two tapped holes that will now allow you to, to act as jack screws. OK, are you with me so far? I'm making sense. There are two tapped holes that you can now run the same mounting bolts that held it in place in that will allow you to gently screw those holes in and now will push the housing out as a result because those holes are tapped into the housing but they meet up blind against the machine casting itself so as you tighten those in you're actually pushing the housing back at you're screwing effectively you're screwing the guide bushing housing back out so um, in that sense to take it out is really easy now there is typically I believe it depends on on the machine. Usually the, there is a. Four bolts that hold the machine on. No, I'm sorry, not the machine. The four bolts that hold the motor on and the motors on swatted mounting holes. And usually there's also a tensioning bolt up against the housing of the motor. So um it's slightly more involved on on adjusting the tension of the belt going back in um so yeah you can take it out without adjusting the tension but yeah you do have to adjust the tension going back in um and that's usually you just loosen the four bolts that hold the motor mount in place you don't have to take the motor out but just allow it to slide a little bit um what some people do is um, there is a 
bolt, as I said, that acts as a tensioner that sets the distance on the slots that hold the motor. And that bolt has a lock screw on it. What they do is, is they do not move the lock, not, not, I'm sorry, I said a lock screw. I meant a locking bolt, a, a hex bolt. What they do is, is they do not move the hex, the locking hex bolt, but they take the entire bolt itself out without moving the lock, locking hex, and loosen the four motor mounts, mounting screws, and um, this allows the entire motor to move and the belt with it. It's making it's hard to just describe this off the top of my head, but you now are able to move the entire motor towards the guide bushing. Belt motor, motor pulley, belt towards the guide bushing. Install the guide bushing. Make sure the belt is around the guide bushing. Now you push the motor back. Your motor mounts are still loose. Guide bushing is now tightened in place. This adjusting bolt you screw that back in to the depth of the previously unmoved locking hex bolt hex nut and everything should now be back in place you should now still be at the original tension that that belt was at tighten your motor mounting bolts and you should be back in place that's one way to do it and rich i haven't done this in a while but i always mm -hmm. slow and careful and I could get it out without adjusting and put it back in without adjusting by being slow, careful and and soft. And, and I actually was able to do that. Do you recommend that? Um, I, I have seen it done. Um, I've had it done. I've done it myself that way uh, on our L12 here. I wasn't quite so lucky, so I did have to actually move the motor. So uh, it sort of depends on the application. It sort of depends okay. on the application. Okay, thank you. And I just want to remind you, you're you're near an hour, and you can go over. I just wanted to remind you where you were. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. So, all right. Well, let's. Uh, and on that subject, let's move on. Okay. So, all right. Here's bearing alignment. Um, yeah, we're getting close. So let's. Uh, yeah, we are getting close. All right. So I have here. You can take your time. Take your time. Yeah. I'm just letting you know. That's all. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, we're going to cover it. It's more important to be thorough. All right, so now, now that I've done these bearings, there's uh, bearing alignment is critical, and I've got a couple of pictures here. One, this is showing now when I've done this and I've greased my bearings, there are alignment marks. You want to make sure that these alignment marks match up, okay? Alignment mark here, alignment mark here. And by the way, this is usually on the inner or flat side. Um, the bearings have two sides, an open or a closed side. And yes, we're going to line this up. Yes, this has to be done. This is very straightforward. They're, they can be very hard to see, but they're there. And I'm going to move on to the next picture. Those alignment marks are here. It's not so easy to see. All right, this is, this is the inner side of the bearing. This is the outer side of the bearing. You see, unfortunately, it's not like the old days. It's very hard to tell them apart. Very, very hard. Very, very hard. OK, well, what do you do? You lay the bearing flat on a surface plate or a granite table or something like that. Lay it flat, press down on the inner race and try to rotate the bearing. If the bearing rotates fine, OK, you are on the outer face. If the bearing doesn't turn fine, you're on the inner face, OK? because the outer face, the inner race will actually protrude outward. OK. All right, does that kind of make sense? I, I also have documentation I can send you on that that may, it's probably clearer to see than actually talk about, interestingly enough. But what I'm talking about is the bearing inner race. Whoops, excuse me. I'm sorry about that. Bearing outer face actually protrudes out here i'm exaggerating is flat here is flat here and actually sticks out here okay so and by the way look there's a mark all right well in this case that actually shows you the protruding side of the bearing so the way these would go into my housing is this face would go out 
my spacers would go here. This space would go out, but I would always check them. Don't necessarily go by these marks, but you do want to make sure the little dots match. Once again, this is a balancing thing. OK, makes sense. It's, it's a little hard to describe. But if I put this bearing on the table and I put this face down and I went to rotate, this bearing would rotate. If I put this bearing on a table and I put this face down and tried to rotate, it would not. Because this is flat. Make sense? That's kind of important, so I, if it doesn't make sense, we'll go over it again. So far, so good. OK, we're going to move on then. All right, so now I can put all the bearings together. I pop them in. In that order I showed you, I've got the spacers in here. Now, if you're good, you can literally just press them in by hand. OK, that's the first bearing going in. Two spacers are going to go in. And then the top bearing is going to go in. I don't have a whole lot of luck with it. OK, maybe you will, maybe you won't. I run about 60, 40, 40% 40 that go right in. I have to tap. If you have to tap only brass, only on the outer, outer race. That's important. If you tap on the inner race, you're, you're, you're damaging the bearing, the ball bearings. Only on the outer race. OK, it's important. OK, but makes sense and you keep those keep those alignment marks in place when you do it. I like to typically line them up with a screw hole. Just as a reference. OK, so you've got the bearings in. All right. All right, now I just throw the spacer in there and see that spacer hole. Now you got to check preload on this particular one. Here's one type of preload gauge. Now preload. I would zero it out say here and measure this depth here. This is the raised edge. This is where the bearing actually is going to bear against the cap. So you want the distance from here to here. And I zero it out here and then to there, zero it out here and then to there, zero, zero, zero it out. All the way around this. So this distance from here to there is less than this distance, which is from here, and notice the bearing is higher. Eight tenths. Important, very important. OK. You get that? That makes sense. This distance is less than this distance by eight tenths. So that cap is going to press down on this bearing race by eight ten thousandths of an inch. OK. Now. We use this. If it's not, what do you have to do? And you would think all bearings would be the same. You'd think you'd be close. You'd be surprised how often you don't. All right. If you're not eight tenths and we use a digital height gauge. Uh, you use something similar to this. Um, you really want eight tenths. Can you go nine tenths? Yeah. Can you go seven tenths? <laughs> I really don't want seven tenths. I want eight tenths. OK, your tolerance is. Is really critical on this, OK? Now. All right, well, that wait a minute. Let me just go back a minute on this. All right, so. If you've got more than eight tenths. If this if that distance is more than eight tenths, you've got more than eight tenths of preload. You got to take the bearing out and you got to grind off of the bearing spacers. If you have less than eight tenths, you have to grind the cap. Is that clear? How do you grind it? A surface grinder. If you don't have a surface grinder, you really can't do this. That's the only way to do it. OK, it's a difficult. It's a touchy, touchy procedure. OK. I wouldn't say it's difficult. It's just uh, exacting. Well, yes, exact, exacting. That's a better word, better word. But it's but it's it is critical. It is critical, something we can't fool with. OK, so you've done that. You've done that and uh, you're happy with your results. 
Now, uh, one of the reasons that's critical is because now you're putting this cap back on. You've 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 ground the cap uh, or you've adjusted the, the spacers. Now you have to put a little bit of sealant on that cap. Now that was that sealant I showed you in one of the first slides. Very little sealant. It goes on white. That sealant. Well, you wipe that stuff off until that what's the sealant that's on that cap is clear. Make sure you don't get in the bearing area. That's just not going to go down onto the bearing shoulder. But you wipe that off until literally that sealant is clear. So there's the, literally there's next to nothing on that cap. And uh, you bolt it down. OK, now with that sealant, that sealant will set up in 30 minutes. It takes 24 hours to, to cure and it's fully, fully impervious in like three days. Now, you might want to keep that in mind if you're just planning on sticking that back in the machine and you're going to start running. Uh, it is on the back side, so you really don't get a whole lot of, uh, of you know, splash down on it or anything else like that, but it is something to keep in mind. OK. Uh, we have a question here, Joe. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, our L20 housings have four bearings with no spacers. How do you compensate if there's no spacers to grind? Um, let me take a look at that. Um, usually, once again, usually it's the cap, or you may even have to actually insert um, a feel gauge style stock on that. Uh, we've had to do that once, but for the most part, generally they're okay. Um, if you if you send me your email address, I will I will respond to that personally on that if that's okay with you, because I'm running out of about uh, ah, running out of time here, and uh, and I want to look at that specifically before I answer just off the top of my head if that's okay. Yeah, we right? we still we still have to either grind the cap, right, or add. And so, like shim stock to mm -hmm. add. Um, so it's the same idea, but different. Just to know you need the eight tenths. That's all. Yeah, yeah. I do think we've had to do that, but only once. And uh, I, I want to review that before I talk off the top of my head. All right. All right. So now we've done that. Now I got my keys in, keeping in mind the orientation. Put the pulley back on. And put the cap nut on. All right, this is the that nut that we put the Loctite on. Now here, now you you do the same indicating maneuvers we did before. Now keeping in mind you knew what you had before, you can you should expect better. But here's the thing. I said add a few drops of the thread lock. Not quite yet. What I like to do is I put this thing together. No thread lock. I put the cap nut on, I tighten it, I back it off, I tighten it, I back it off, I tighten it. Now I do my indicator work. I still haven't put any thread lock on it, and I check with my indicator. Why do I do that? Well, what happens if I've done something wrong? If I've done something wrong, I'm, I'm tearing it apart again. Well, if I put thread lock on that, <laughs> I've just created a headache for myself. So I check my work, make sure it's good, Oh, it is good. Now I can take that cap nut off, put my four dots of thread lock on it, tighten it back down, recheck with an indicator, and I'm good to go. You'd think, right? Yeah, OK. Put the cap back on, too, because you want to know that the cap is not causing any interference with your readings, OK? All right, so are we done? No, we're not. We're not done. You got to break these bearings in. Now, this is just a generic program we send out, but you've installed it in the machine. You got to break these bearings in. This is pretty much a generic program. Uh, there's there's a couple of them out there floating around. Uh, the sum and substance of it is you run it for 100 RPM, give it 10 minutes. Run it for 500, 10 minutes, back to 100. Now, if you want, you can reverse it, you know, reverse direction. Uh, the thing is, is after you've run it for say 500 RPM, 10 minutes, feel that guide bushing. Is it hot? It, it shouldn't be. By the time you get up to 2000, or the time you get up to 6000 RPM, yeah, you should expect to feel some heat, but you don't want to feel it burning. You don't want to feel excessive heat. Um, you can get it up to 6000 RPM for 10 minutes, 
then back down 100 RPM for 10 minutes, and that should about do it. And then you can consider that those bearings have been broken in. One last thing, however, please make sure they put the air purge back on because the air purge helps to keep a bit of positive air pressure inside the guide bushing, helps with cooling, and also keeps contamination out of the bearings. Okay, make sense? Uh, yep, uh, we got a question. Uh, any recommendations for how tight the nut needs to be? Tight, tight. I mean, you're not gonna, we don't have a torque wrench specification on that, but it's gonna be, it's gonna be as tight as you can put that on there. Um, and you do need the, the, the Loctite on it because, uh, you know, these guide bushings do spin both directions and you don't want it to, to back off. Um, do you have to put it on with a hammer? Uh, wouldn't be un, un, unwarranted to tap it with a hammer, but n um, not, no tighter than that. Okay. Okay. And we have a question. What percentage of guide bushing repairs or replacements are done in the field versus being sent to MCC? I, I'll be honest with you. I don't honestly think that you can do many of them in the field. Um, number one, remember, you need a surface grinder. Uh, you need a vise. Uh, I don't think, I, I would say most of them come back to us. I'll be honest with you, folks. We don't charge a lot of money for it. And by the time, you know, the price of the parts is the price of the parts. Um, I'll, I'll add that a lot of dealers do it in the field. Um, so it, I think it's it's hard to give that number, but there's definitely done in the field also. Okay, um, I defer on that one. Um, I, I know we get them on a pretty regular basis. We turn them around. Um, if you're gonna do them in the field, I, I recommend uh, you make up tooling for that purpose um, because it makes it a lot easier. Uh, as you see, based on this, there, there, there's a lot to it to do it right. Um, you, you can't hurt. Look, you, you can do a guide bushing in an hour and a half, and that's about how long it'll last. To be honest with you, um, they, they, they take us some time, and you know, it, it, you, you, you can't determine how long is it going to take. I honestly can't tell you because, can you do it in six hours? Sure, you can do it in six hours. Can you do it in two days? Yeah, <laughs> I got one on the bench right now. I. It's gonna it's gonna be two days before we're done with it and i hate to say that but you know sometimes the bear sometimes the bear wins you know um i have one more quick picture this is an alternate one this is a k16 when you talk about doing them in a field this is a different type co configuration real quick um you're gonna see that yeah it's a very different sleeve this the drive mounts down here. That's your your uh, key bearing. Very small bearing spacer. Another bearing. They mount here. They they screw on. Here's your retainer here. There's your other bearings. But look at how deep they are. Without a special tool, you're never going to get this off. Now they, that's the bearings are actually mounted. This is just a spacer, so you understand that. And that's the cap up top that holds the whole thing together. There's no way you're getting this out without a special tool. Um, the good news is, however, there's no preload required. You put this thing in, you put it in together tight, and uh, you're good to go. Um, just, just, just an alternate configuration. So um, it depends on what you're trying to do. It depends on how many of them you're going to do. Um, these are some other just configurations: three bearings, two bearings, three bearings, and the orientation of the bearings. Um, that's pretty much it, folks. Uh, unless there's any other questions, I think we've covered it. Um, um, so uh, this is a statement which I think is good. I hope Joe didn't read this already. Would you recommend to check the distance from the housing to the bearing, the eight tenths, before taking the old bearing out, then replacing bearings? Or does eight tenths is a standard number that I can work with? Only ask because if guide bushing is new, that distance may be different. So he's not he's not even asking the question properly because you have to take it all apart to even check this. But uh. well, I would say no. It, there, there's no value in checking it beforehand. And uh, surprisingly, as we're finding that the the bearing width of of bearings varies. So. 
um, really there's no advantage to checking it in the, in the first place. Um, you, you can assume that when it was built that it was made correct, but once we put a different set of bearings in it, all bets are off. So there, there's no advantage to doing that. I can tell you what I've done in the past is a double check. I still do all the procedures you talked about, but to start off, I just measure the bearing width of the pre the old set when I take them out. And probably the two of them are perfectly the same. They're a set, but you never know. So I measure them. And then I measure the new ones. And basically, you're probably grinding or adding the number that's the difference, probably. But it's just a, a second way to, to guesstimate where you are before you measure. You know? Yeah, actually, I've, I, I've tried that. I, um, I had some rather indifferent results on that, though. So, so I, I, I just like the empirical data of, OK, it's assembled. This is what we've got. So uh, yeah, well, it's not the answer. It's just another way to double check yourself. That's all right. Right. OK, so there is no more questions. Um, I'll start to end this. So thank you, Rich. You did a great job. Thank you for putting this together for us. OK, thanks, Brian. Thanks you all for attending. And if uh, please again, come see our other content we have by uh, the end of this week and next week.